every individual that we can inspire, that we can guide, that we can help to start a new company is vital to the future of our economic welfare. These words from our founder, Ewing Marion Kaufman, serve as the ethos of what the foundation exists to do. It is also the sacred charge for those of us privileged to work in furtherance of our donors' intentions. Today, we review the legacy of this great entrepreneur and philanthropist that established the importance of supporting entrepreneurship at all levels of society. I'm Tom Rue, and this is Top of Mind. During his lifetime, Ewing Kaufman took the unconventional path to enrich others. He created jobs and recast the economy of his hometown. He found inspiration from the education he received, and his life as an entrepreneur informed his approach to philanthropy. Ewing Marion Kaufman was born on a farm in Garden City, Missouri on September 21, 1916. His family moved to Kansas City when he was a boy, and he called Kansas City home for the rest of his life. Following his service in the Navy during World War II, Ewing Kaufman began working as a salesman for a pharmaceutical company to support his family, and he was a brilliant salesman. But when he earned more in sales commissions than the president of the company did, his employer cut his sales territory. And that was a move that prompted Mr. Kaufman to strike out on his own. And so he did in 1950 when he started a pharmaceutical sales company. He named his company Marion Laboratories, Inc., using his middle name rather than his last name so his customers wouldn't think he was running a one-man operation. Ewing Kaufman was the prototypical entrepreneur who started with very few resources. He sold medications to doctors during the day and counted tablets into bottles from the basement of his home to fill orders at night. In his first year in business, he had sales of $36,000 and a net profit of $1,000. Yet from that humble beginning, Mr. Kaufman and his associates grew Marion Labs into a billion dollar company over four decades. But Mr. K built more for Kansas City than just a global business that had over 3,400 employees. By establishing the Kansas City Royals in 1968, he brought Major League Baseball back to his hometown. Once he committed to the idea, he poured the same energy, resources, and entrepreneurial approach that made him a successful businessman into his new venture. He made the Royals a model sports franchise and built a beautiful and distinctive home for the team that was, frankly, decades ahead of its time. During his time as owner, Mr. Kaufman's competitive nature and innovative ideas fueled the team. His unconventional approach included using computers to analyze baseball statistics and establishing the Royals Baseball Academy, the laboratory where the science of baseball was discovered. With Mr. K as the team's owner, the Royals developed young players who won six division titles, two American League pennants, and won a World Series championship in 1985. Mr. Kaufman's most enduring legacy to his community, and the world for that matter, is the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. He established the foundation with the same sense of opportunity he brought to his business endeavors and with the same convictions. His visionary instincts and positive influence extended to his pragmatic approach to philanthropy. That concentrated on finding novel solutions to society's problems. Mr. Kaufman wanted his foundation to help young people, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds, get a quality education that would enable them to reach their full potential. And he knew from his own experience, his own deep entrepreneurial experience, that starting and growing companies is one of the most effective ways to realize individual promise, to spur economic growth, and to extend human welfare. You should not choose to be a common company. It's your right to be uncommon if you can. You seek opportunity to compete you desire to take the calculated risk to dream, to build, yes, even to fail, and to succeed. Today, we know 
from Kaufman Research that thriving startup hubs do not just pop up overnight. The base is often laid by the strength and the talent of existing sectors and corporations throughout the region. Mr. Kaufman certainly played a part in creating the base for Kansas City's now flourishing hub and the work of the foundation shares that know-how with the rest of the world. To get a greater insight of the man that legitimized entrepreneurship as a philanthropic pursuit, we sat down with Steve Rowling, former senior counsel for the president at the foundation, who had the great privilege to work closely with Mr. K before his passing in 1993. Steve shared with us memories of a man who lived for the art of sales, appreciated a quick mind and a good read, and knew what the culture of a workplace meant for the morale of his employees and the good of his business. When I came over on my first day, Mr. Kaufman had a, had a ritual that all new associates met him for the first day. And meeting Mr. Kaufman was a, an extinct honor because he is such a, a humble man, but such a, a wonderful human being that it's, it's an honor just to be in his presence. And everyone who lives in this community and clearly works in, in this community knows that. So on the first day I went in to meet him and, and uh, it was a funny story. Uh, my last edition of the Kansas City Business Journal, for the first time in our history of our paper, we endorsed the political candidate. The mayor's race was going on. And we endorsed Emmanuel Cleaver over his opponent. And the only thing on Mr. K's desk, we have this huge office with this huge desk and this small man sitting behind it. And the only thing on it was, was a copy of the Kansas City Business Journal. And my first thought was, he didn't like who we endorsed, <laughs> and I'm about ready to be fired <laughs> before it's I calling start. calling you out on it. <laughs> but uh, he didn't mention it. Linda Constantine told me that he reads the Kansas City Visitor every Monday morning, and so he just happened to have it on his desk. So uh, we talk, and he welcomes me to the company, and, and uh, we talk about some of my background. And so the second day, Linda calls me up and says, Mr. Coffin, I'd like to see you. And Mr. Coffin meets a lot of people, so I said, Linda, you may remember I met him yesterday. I, you know, I... I've already had my introduction meeting. He said, no, he wants to see you again. He, he wants you to come back. So I went back the second day, and Mr. Kaufman told me about this concept, this idea that he and a few of his pals, both inside the company and some of the community leaders, had been kicking around for a meeting or two. And because of my background with the Business Journal, he thought maybe I could provide some staff support. So on my second day, I became the staff person for this rump group of folks, uh, uh, Paul Henson, who founded Sprint, Burt Berkeley of Tension, uh, Jim McGraw, Bob Rogers, Mickey Slaughter, and Mike Herman was kind of the initial group. It was that first cabal. That I was the staff person. And so w the, the, the charge was, is it legal? And if it is, should a foundation get involved in the subject of entrepreneurship? Can you teach it? If you can, how would you do it? And who would you do it with? And how would you set it up? How would you organize it? But the first question was, does it make sense or even legal for a foundation to get involved in the subject of entrepreneurship? You know, it's, what's fascinating for me, you know, I've been here for the last six years. So you were around for the first dozen or so years. And, you know, we take it as ubiquitous now, entrepreneurship. And lots of foundations are getting on that bandwagon. And Academia, you know, there's been a mass proliferation of entrepreneurship curriculums and courses, but that wasn't the case when you guys were coming together. Did, did Mr. K ever share with you, like, was it just something he intuited from his own personal experience, or why did he focus on entrepreneurship? Well, I think it was his own experience, but it was also the experience of all the work we were already doing at the Coffee Foundation at the time with young people. We, we had several programs, operating programs, we called them at the time, where the Kauffman Foundation staff were running programs in Kansas City to help urban youth graduate from school, um, keep off drugs, build self-esteem, etc. And Mr. Kauffman noticed that all these children, their, their ultimate goal in life was to um, work for somebody or to not get shot. Or, I mean, they had no goals that would lead them to taking care of their family. And, and many of them didn't have role models. And so Mr. Kaufman said, I remember the, he said this one day, he said, how do we teach somebody that the ultimate goal in life is not working for McDonald's, but owning McDonald's? How do we teach these urban kids? And, and while Mr. Kaufman was not, he was not raised in urban Kansas City, 
he was a poor kid from a poor family, and he had nothing going for him. And he became this multi-millionaire who did lots of stuff for, for our city and our country and our world. How do you how do you help other kids have that same kind of experience? So, you know, we've heard um, many stories on that. I mean, we've referenced earlier, you know, his, his notion that they're not, you know, we're not employees, we're associates of one another. And that, you know, we have this kind of shared mission and vision to the success of the organization. But that didn't necessarily mean he was a soft, cuddly, pushover kind of guy, right? That, that'd be correct, that'd be correct. Mr. Coffin was hard. Um, my first, um, I, have, I have two stories. I have a story that, that shows that cuddly side, and then I have a story that doesn't necessarily show that cuddly side. Well, let's start with the soft side. <laughs> the soft side was, uh, far the, I'd been here maybe two or three weeks, and I'd made a couple trips talking to people. And Mr. Coffin asked me to uh, make a presentation to his uh, board. And the board at that time was Mr. Coffin and three or four of his personal lifelong friends. And um, he asked me to present to them kind of my original concept of what I was thinking and does it make sense to continue this discussion about a foundation starting in the field of entrepreneurship. And so I was preparing slides and I was working on some stuff and writing stuff and, you know, it was a big deal to present to Mr. Kaufman and to his board. Sure. So uh, I'm in there working in my office and Bob Rogers, who at that time was the president of the foundation, came in and was looking at what I was preparing and my phone rings. And it was my daughter Susie, who was probably in the sixth or seventh grade. And she was telling me that her, her volleyball game was canceled from X time to Y time and the Y time happened to be the same time that I was going to make my presentation to Mr. K and the board. Uh oh. So I was explaining to Susie quickly because Bob was sitting right there that I can't come to her volleyball game. I'm sorry, I've got to make this presentation. And Bob could tell that Susie wasn't buying what I was selling, <laughs> that she wasn't real wild about my answer that I wasn't going to go to her game. It wasn't the World Series of Volleyball. It was a fifth grade, sixth grade volleyball game. So I got off the phone and told Bob, you know, let's continue. And he said, he looked at me and he said, Steve, Mr. K wouldn't, he wouldn't want that. He'd want you to go to the game. And I said, Bob, this is presenting to the board of directors are going to my daughter's volleyball game. And he said, yeah, he'd, he'd want you to go to the game because it obviously means a lot to your daughter. And you've right. got these slides already done. I can do the slides. I mean, you've, I, I know what you're doing. And I said, okay. So I went to the volleyball game and Bob made the presentation to the board. So the next morning I come to the office. I usually get the office pretty early and I'm sitting at my desk and I look up and my desk, and my office is not very close to Mr. K's office. I mean, it's like a whole building apart. And for Mr. K to find my office, he had to make an effort. He had to make a real effort. So about 7.30 in the morning, I look up, and there's Mr. Coffin in my doorway. And I look up, and my first reaction was, oh, hell, I made the wrong choice. <laughs> I should have went to the board. But he looked at me, and he said uh, something to the effect of uh, good presentation. Bob, you know, I'm really pleased with where we're going. He asked me a few questions. And then he became, he came back behind my desk, put his arms around my shoulders, and he said, I'm, I'm really uh, proud of you for making that decision. Uh, obviously, it's very emotional still. Uh, well, clearly he understood the value of family. And so from that second on, he had me. Uh, you can talk about how do you treat people, but uh, one volleyball game was important. Well, like many parent figures in our life, you know, that's the time that you need to be soft and there to support, you know, those in your charge. But there's also time okay, that you've got to be side. stiff, right? <laughs> the other side. <laughs> I mean, I've got three kids, so all three of which are teenagers, so I know this part, too. Well, I made Ms. Mr. I didn't know this, but Mr. K was a speed reader. He could read a book as fast as you could turn the pages and not just read it, but know it. And so like a fool, he asked me, he always asked me to do reports in the early days to give him stuff to read so he would be up on stuff. And then, well, what I didn't know is he went home and read them word for word uh -oh. by speed reading. So the next morning I come in <laughs> for my meeting and he would, he'd said something like on page, and the books were closed, and he said, I think it was on page 60, it says, what, what, is, what do you think that means? I go, oh my God, am I in trouble. So 
he made it very clear to me that um, he wasn't playing. When I present it to something to him, I better know it and I better be able to back it up. And if I agree with it, that's okay. If I disagree with it, I better have some uh, some reasons behind it. But this was not a this was not a show deal. This was this was real. And if I was going to prepare something for him, I owed him the respect to put his the effort into it to really know what I was doing. So I never presented anything <laughs> ever again. He made it very clear to you. He was pretty direct. Yes, yeah. he was in a in a respectful nice, way. But he was he was direct. I want to reflect kind of then and now. You know, how do you think, you know, the entrepreneurial world or the world of entrepreneurship and advancing entrepreneurship has changed since your time here at the foundation? Well, uh, it started when I was here. There was one, sorry, <laughs> there was one foundation that had any funding on the field of entrepreneurship, and now there's lots. Um, there was only Babson and Harvard who were teaching entrepreneurship. And now there's lots. There was no foundation teaching, uh, or no university teaching social entrepreneurship. That started here also. So the field of entrepreneurship is, is cool now. I mean, I told you the story of NPR. NPR, we went to Washington and met with the folks, and they, I mean, they treated me kind of like, who in the hell are you? One, from Kansas City, but two, I mean, we're NPR, we're you know, we, we, we know this stuff. We're, right. we're, we're news people. And so I sent them a bunch of stuff. And, uh, and then they, unbeknownst to us, came to Kansas City and visited because they were really scared that if a foundation gives you money to cover a subject, are they going to force you to write the story the way right. the foundation wants? And so they wanted to kind of get our DNA, what are we like to work with? And so finally they brought uh, their general manager at Kansas City and we cut a deal and then they hired three or four reporters to, to cover entrepreneurship and that and that really helped NPR reaches everywhere and that really I think helped the movement of entrepreneurship because again it became ordinary it became um, of course people do entrepreneurship well it validated right because right. I, I heard it on NPR it must be real uh, there's a there's a lot of stuff that just happened to hit but I believe this foundation played a significant role in, in making that word more than a word, but more of a movement. Boy, I, I couldn't think of a better way to wrap this interview up, on, but on that note. And I think uh, everybody here today, all the associates that have the good fortune as I do to work here, try to embody that and live that every day. And I'd like to, on their behalf, thank you for the early pioneering work that you did to build this or start this legacy that is now entrusted to us. Mr. K started it. We all were riding along with the train, but uh, he, was, he was the leader. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, Steve. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, sir. Every individual that we can inspire, that we can guide, that we can help to start a new company is vital to the future of our economic welfare.